Um, my name is Josh Scott. I'm going to be hosting a conversation today with two people who really don't need much of an introduction, so we're going to make it brief so they can get to talking. Um, first, we have Diana Butler Bass, an author and public theologian. We're going to be talking today about her spiritual memoir, Freeing Jesus, Rediscovering Jesus as Friend, Teacher, Savior, Lord, Way, and Presence. Um, and we also have with us Bill McKibben, author and environmentalist. We'll be talking about his memoir, The Flag, The Cross, and The Station Wagon. A graying American looks back at his suburban boyhood and wonders what the hell happened. Um, so, with all of that in mind, um, both of your stories, your memoirs, are fascinating and wonderful, and there are so many similarities. Uh, you, you travel together in so many ways. You also, at points, diverge and then come back together in other ways. And so I think the first question uh, really is raised by the title of Bill's book, and that is, what the hell happened? Um, so yeah, Diana, what the hell happened? Well, I've had that same question most of my life. And for those of you who don't know, Bill and I are essentially the same age. Um, I was born in 59, and were you born in the beginning of 61 or the end of 60? December 1960. December 1960. So he was in the high school class one year behind me, which means that the pair of us sort of basically grew up in the same world. And um, my writing has been very memoir oriented, reflecting specifically on religion and politics and looking at this long, many decade journey and my friends and family <laughs> and often saying, what happened? And so I have been trying to sort my way through that question. So when I saw Bill's book, uh, with the specific question on the front, I knew that I had to read it, which I did. And we've been in conversation about our two memoirs um, online before. So so that's the, I think the thing is, is what happened? Those of us who were born kind of at the middle end of the 20th century had so much optimism and joy and hope for the future, and we were gonna change the world, and we wound up with what we have. <laughs> well, I want to say, first of all, this is uh, extraordinarily fun for me because uh, I've been reading, I've read everything Diana's ever read. I feel like, you know, those people who uh, show up at Dylan concerts and they've got every single album, but now they're, you know, cataloging their bootleg tapes of the, uh, you know, this night in Harmony, North Carolina, this what I. Uh, so it's what fun to be here. And um, um, so we were born at the same moment and sort of started out in the same way a little bit in the uh, kind of mainline Protestant church. But Diana was way ahead of the curve. Uh, she sensed what was coming and, and uh, found herself often, uh, uh, for a while, often in a kind of entirely different uh, uh, religious world. I was completely clueless, um, I, and, and in a kind of strange, relic way, didn't even notice that any of this was going on, um, the kind of decline of the church world that I've been born into, because where I was, it wasn't happening. Uh, uh, I, I, the UCC church that I grew up in was strong, remained so. I went off to college, and uh, Peter Gomes was my preacher for four years, was one of the great preachers there ever was. Um, and then I went to New York City to go to write for the New Yorker. I wrote the, went to New York when I was 21 and wrote the talk of the town and the New Yorker and spent six years at uh, Riverside Church where Bill Coffin was the uh, minister. So as far as I was concerned, it was all still, everything was just as it always had been. And then I moved out into the middle of nowhere, very the most remote wilderness in the American East up in the Adirondack Mountains. Uh, and, and there in the tiny Methodist churches, no one really had noticed either. Things just kept, you know, where there were, I was teaching Sunday school and we were still singing to the Lord and give me oil in my lamp. And, you know, and, and, and it was only at a certain point that I looked up and said, what happened to, you know, this uh, Christian enterprise that I thought I was a part of? 
how did it suddenly end up in the custody of all these people that, that seem crazy to me, you know? And, and how did that happen? Those were my friends at the time. There you go. So then, then I started reading Diana, and now I understand more or less how it all happened. So, you know. uh, one thing, so we forgot to mention while we're going on, there's two clipboards coming around. And uh, that's a, so those are sign-up sheets. Bill and I both have Substack newsletters. Mine's called The Cottage, it's called The Cursor Leaders. And we invite you to sign up, give us your email address, and we're gonna share those lists. If you're at one of the other of those things, don't worry. When we enter your names into the program, it won't repeat it. So uh, if you wanna sign up for one, the other, or both, that's going around. Um, I, I love what you just said, Bill, because I probably wouldn't have known it was happening either, other than the fact that in 1972, uh, my parents left the East Coast. And uh, there were lots of reasons for that that I've written about, partly because of uh, white flight after the riots. Uh, but later on, I figured out through some rather securitous routes uh, that the other reason was probably because my father was a closeted gay man and that his father found out and my parents escaped. So I moved from Maryland where I grew up in a liberal Methodist church and had, that's where our childhoods are so much the same. Um, and then we went to Arizona and all of a sudden there was religious diversity, there were Native Americans, there were all these people from Mexico and there was evangelical Christianity. And I wound up in a church called Scottsdale Bible Church. Oh, Lord have you. Yeah, I heard somebody say, oh, Jesus. <laughs> and I always say it now as a prayer, oh, Jesus, please, please, Jesus, heal these people. Um, and so I started there when it was a small church, about 300 people, now has about 30,000 people. And is the center, it, they founded a seminary where Wayne Grudem, okay, complementarianism uh, guy, uh, is the main biblical scholar. And so I went from this comfortable, amazing, sort of insulated Protestant world of the middle part of the 20th century to what became the seedbed uh, for the religious right. And uh, so I have both experiences. And I think that forced me to ask the question earlier. Um, yeah. Where you lived, you would keep going on with certain kinds of assumptions about the Bible and religion and science and religion and politics. And I envy that. I would give anything to have Peter Gomes as my chaplain rather than be paying attention to what Chuck Smith at Calvary Chapel Coast de Mesa was saying. So. It, it, was, it was a very charmed um, life in that respect. And I'm grateful for it. But it did, it does mean that it always did all the rest of it, the stuff that actually turned out to be the dominant uh, Christian mode or whatever, still seems somewhat unreal to me. And I, and I, 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 and, and I should say, I mean, I, we're, uh, we're talking about spiritual memoir here. Uh, I, I turned out I couldn't even write an actual memoir of any kind, but by this attempt of mine quickly turned into a uh, uh, political argument anyway, and I, you know, whatever. But, um, but you know, the links between what was happening spiritually and politically in this period seemed so interesting to me. Um, I was, we were talking about this a little bit yesterday when we had a little workshop around climate stuff here. Um, sometime in this same period, our political life took pretty much the same course. We went from a, uh, we went from a world where most Americans were engaged in a kind of group project of one way or another trying to make the country a better place, something that had sort of come out of the New Deal and the war. And then even all the kind of contentious parts of the 1960s were still about sort of creating that beloved community at some level. Uh, uh, and, and, and in which the mainline Protestant church was a deep mover uh, all through. And then, and I think the key moments the election of Ronald Reagan, we decide that we're in a, instead engaged in a series of individual projects about our own advancement. That's what was going to solve our political problems, markets solve all problems. And it's right at the same moment that we decide that the actual point of Christianity is this highly individualized, your own salvation is the point. 
kind of thing. Um, um, and and the, the coincidence of those things means they can't be a coincidence. They're deeply overlapping, deeply uh, so, you know, reinforcing kind of uh, ideas. One of the things, as soon as you start talking about that, is I think that when we were children, the idea of a city set upon a hill was being challenged to understand it as a, a, as a peaceable kingdom. That was what Vietnam did for us. It sort of went, woke us up and said, oh, wait a second, we're part of a military industrial complex, and we don't want to be here, at least an awful lot of Americans did, we want a different kind of vision of peace. And then on the other hand, the civil rights movement was saying, uh, we got left out of the city of San Panico. It, it was built on our backs. And so therefore, you really need to listen and rights need to be expanded. And so I think when, if somebody would have asked me when I was a little kid, what is the city set upon a hill? I would have said, uh, a much more open and democratic and peaceable America where everyone is recognized and everyone has rights. And that would have been the vision that would have been shared in my Methodist church. But we get to Ronald Reagan and that completely changes what the city so Hill is. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that really interested me when I was doing the kind of background report, the, 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 book that I uh, wrote most recently was about growing up in the suburbs of Boston in a town called Lexington, Massachusetts, which was interesting in its own right because of its deep association with American history. Uh, I was a tour guide for my high school years on the battle green. I would wear my tricorn hat and walk around. <laughs> but one of the things that was interesting, and looking back, I went back and did a lot of uh, combing through the newspapers and things of the town in the 60s was the degree to which, in this you know, uh, uh, very standard uh, suburban community, uh, the churches had been the key engine of driving an awful lot of the work around civil rights and around the peace movement, far more than I would have guessed. Um, and, 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 and how involved in that process they had been. And that was the world I assumed was going to keep going, and the one that did ground pretty quickly to a kind of crashing halt. And part of the reason why, his, at least historians have pinpointed that political involvement of mainline churches as the very reason why, in the next decade, they declined. And that has always been a little shocking to me is that the church that I grew up in, it was kind of moderate, theological, a little bit liberal. Nobody was like thought religion and science were close to each other, any of that kind of stuff. Um, but there was some contention over these issues. There were certainly white people in my church who didn't like black people. And there were certainly people who thought that those who were opposing Vietnam were hippies. Uh, but there was the other side too, where there were, like my mother, uh, was very pro-civil rights movement, she had a lot of sympathy towards what was going on in Vietnam. She, she, she voted Democrat all the time and tried to convince them to get out of the war. So there were plenty of people around, even in my Maryland childhood and Methodism, that were a little bit on both sides, but that the church, the institutions of the church, the seminaries of the church, the clergy of the church, were all pushing, pushing, pushing toward feminism, civil rights, and the peace movement. And that's what backfired on them. Well, yes, it's clearly the danger of taking the Bible seriously is, a, you know, that's a, that, that, is a, that is a deep danger. You, you know, you, um, and, and of course, it was sort of bound to happen. I mean, in 1960, I, I couldn't believe the statistics when I looked them up, but they were in that book by that guy, Mark Silk, I think. Yeah. Um, um, when, when Eisenhower went to lay the cornerstone for the um, inner church center in, uh, up by Riverside Church in Manhattan, the God Box, um, the kind of Protestant uh, Vatican, when he laid the cornerstone for that, 52% of Americans belonged to one of the six mainline denominations. I mean, which meant that, I mean, of course it was going to blow apart at some point because it was 
you know, I mean, it was the, the you baptized the status quo in essence, you know, and 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 there's many. I mean, I, I think in the end, it's probably quite healthy that a lot of it. You know, we're going to end up in a healthier place. The church probably is better off as the counterculture than it is as the culture, you know, so on and so forth. But just the the the. You know, we're still living in the aftershock of that. And you've done a better job of monitoring it by far than anybody else and, and helping sort of understand what pieces are left around to pick up and how we go from here and so on. But it is just worth acknowledging what a remarkable, there's been no demographic change in the country as remarkable as that one in my lifetime to go from 52% of the population to 14% or something of the population. I think it's 13.8 as of right now. I mean, that's, uh, those numbers never uh, cease to amaze me. And if you threw in all of the Protestants in 1960, not just the mainline ones that were being celebrated by the construction of that giant building on Riverside Drive, which didn't go up for sale last year? It's, it's, there's very little, I mean, yeah, I think it is. There's not that many church things left there anymore. Yeah. Yeah, so the religious tradition we knew as, as kids has been in a fire sale, basically, for the last uh, decade, including these great institutions that were erected right around the time of our birth. Um, and so one of the things I think is really stunning about that, as the main line began this sort of precipitous decline to being a main line, to being a cross-cultural or counter-cultural church, uh, which is really the journey we've been through. Uh, the evangelicals decided, hey, let's stop being countercultural and instead let's take over government. <laughs> <laughs> and so they picked up the political pieces, and of course it was the exact opposite of politics. And they then said, we're going to position ourselves essentially as the new main line. Yes, and which leads to the, you know, I, I, I've spent, I, I mean, I, as you can tell, I'm a little out of my depth here because I've spent my whole life working on issues around climate and science and environmentalism and stuff and just going to church, you know, not thinking about it that much. But, um, but, God bless you. But, uh, <laughs> but, but, uh, but in, now that, now that that's become such a, it, it, now that we're in the fourth or fifth decade of that being such a potent political force, and now that it becomes with each passing year an ever more egregiously nasty political force, um, it does seem to me that one of the, and I've been doing a little writing about this recently, that one of the jobs of this remnant, whatever we are, 13% or whatever that's left, is to uh, uh, be aggressively making the case that secular Americans can't make, secular Americans can make uh, all, all the kind of correct cases about why the policy implications of uh, that right wing thing are wrong and stupid, and they are, and they're doing a good job. The one case they can't make is that, uh, you know, uh, what these guys are preaching is, is the exact opposite of what the Gospels tell us to do. And that part seems to me the why, you know, within our purview to be making that case over and over again, to say this is not, a, the Jesus you're talking about is not one that we recognize, and it's not in uh, the Bible that we read, and, and that's important because that actually does help, I think, politically undercut some of that power. If people are allowed to claim um, um, the gospel as their authority for doing hateful things, that's bad politically. But it's also, in the end, terrible for people's understanding to the degree that we think the gospel is an important thing. It's terrible to let people. I mean, I, I was writing the other day about something like if you, if you. Uh, uh, sit down and read the Gospels, and you come out of it saying, 
well, I think I'd like to buy an AK-47, then you have read them wrong. And, and, and so one can make one can make a good, strong argument against selling, you know, assault rifles to people on a hundred different grounds, you know, very pragmatic grounds and so on and so forth. But it's also worth making it on the grounds that this is that, that you've just wildly taken you you I mean, the decision that to essentially baptize, I mean, in some cases almost literally baptize and bless uh, 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 machine guns uh, is. It, it, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's a blasphemy, yes. Did you know there's one company that actually makes those assault rifles and they put Bible verses on the side of them? <laughs> I mean, I mean, yeah. that's, that is, uh, that's, that's the definition of blasphemy, sacrilege. Uh, and it's worth calling it out in those terms as well as calling And I, I was saying yesterday that one of the things that always annoys me in the Methodist church is, we passed endless resolutions in general conference, right? These long, you know, detailed explanations of what, what's going on, why we think climate change is a bad idea, and citing all these scientists. It, it would be much stronger if we, I mean, there's plenty of scientists to do that. It, it, if our part was to say, you know, Jesus told us to love our neighbors, and at the moment we're drowning our neighbors and whatever, so we can't be part of this. We've got to stand up to it. That's a more effective witness, it seems to me, for Christians to make in the, with the kind of Christian part of their identity. Well, one of the misconceptions I think folks on the conservative evangelical side have is that they, because they take, they, see, they think they take the Bible literally, that they take it more seriously, and that folks in mainline progressive traditions don't care about the Bible. I think what you're saying is exactly the important thing, which is that we actually care a lot about the Bible. We just actually want to take it seriously. Right. Right. so interesting, just as a, someone who spent my life as a rider, and you spent your life as a rider, too, and you got um, the idea that, that, that I, mean, I know that this is an old idea that's been fought over for a long time, but you would have thought that we would have gotten past the, well, you know, the I mean, this point, that, that things that, that a book that great was to be read literally, like it was a you know, recipe book or something. Um, um, you know, um, um, I mean, it's much too important to be taken literally. You have to actually take it seriously. That's right. That's right. Um, that's right. Well, that's been part of the um, the fight. I mean, the, I always think about this sort of longer arc of history in the 20th century, where at the beginning of the 20th century, what becomes the main line, that word wasn't generally used very much until the 1950s and 1960s, actually right before we were born. Uh, what becomes the main line was originally something that was just called Protestantism. <laughs> and Protestantism had a lot of different denominational families. And it had, uh, beginning in the late 19th and early 20th century, two great theological parties that developed within it. And one of the great theological parties were the people who were modernists or liberals. And those are the folks who mostly became the main line. And the other theological party were the fundamentalists. And once the people who had self-named their movement, the fundamentalist movement, realized that they had chosen a bad name, they changed their name to evangelicals. It was softer, but they're the same people the fundamentalists and evangelicals. And so the fundamentalists were mad because people didn't like them. And they didn't want to join their churches. And so they started on sort of this long campaign, decade-long campaign, to re rehabilitate their own image and try to attract more people into their churches. And a big part of that was setting up the liberal mainline as their enemies. And so what you just described, I mean, what you described too, Josh, is part of that campaign. Uh, part of that campaign was to convince America that people who were in liberal and mainline 
churches didn't read the Bible, and they didn't know theology, and that they didn't care about Jesus, and that they don't care about your spiritual life. And they warned their own people that if you ever hung out, it was better to hang out with Jews and Catholics than it was to hang out with liberal Presbyterians. Liberal Presbyterians were more dangerous than people from other religions. And so what happened was this whole, like two or even three generations of people within evangelical churches became brainwashed that if you ever walked into the door of a liberal mainline church, it was all going to be heresy, sort of stupidity, bad worship, and people who don't know anything about God. And so now that people are leaving evangelicalism, when I talk to folks, one, they're almost completely unaware that there's this Protestantism that we grew up with. Uh, or two, they're terrified to go in the doors of those churches because all they've heard their entire life is that there are womanist, child mutilator, feminist, anti-Bible, evolutionary scientists in those buildings who are going to send you to hell. And when they say that about us, I say, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, we're not the hell part. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, science, feminism, we care about gay people, all these things. You're going to find something, a different kind of Christianity. But, essentially, the traditions we're a part of were, the, were part of the crossfire, and we got identified as the enemy. And and didn't didn't mount much of a fight back in any serious way about it. Partly because I think we were all well socialized to be um, nice, nice um, <laughs> at, at, at all times, and incredibly tolerant, and all viewpoints are you know. And, and also, I think because we somewhat arrogantly assumed that uh, that it was just impossible that people were actually going to uh, choose, um, uh, uh, you know, that, that in the world we lived in, it was unlikely that people were going to choose churches that said women can't be pastors or have a role or whatever. And, and, and what do you know? We were wrong. Um, uh, there was an incredible amount of uh, uh, residual uh, uh, we hadn't gotten as far over the hump as we thought we had as a society and we've learned that in all kinds of ways around race and gender and lots of other things it does strike me that there are interesting uh, that we're in an interesting moment now um, where clearly the, the wheels are coming off the evangelical uh, bus uh, uh, almost as spectacularly, and it's fascinating to watch, just in the last couple of weeks, to watch, say, Rick Warren say, well, I've had enough of the Southern Baptists, you know, whatever. Um, 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 so some of the same processes are, are, are starting to happen, and it'll be interesting to see where we end up. But I do think that, that we have a big, good, useful role to play in, in enunciating a kind of different, a reminder that there are fascinating other forms that this can take. And you've done such a good job of writing about how the mainline church had to come to terms with the fact that, yes, indeed, actually, all of us at some level do think about individual, uh, uh, our own individual spiritual lives, too, which was not something that, you know, uh, that that old mainline church paid a whole lot of attention to. They assumed it. Yeah. Uh, what? It's, uh, I'll just say it's also fascinating to watch these same things playing out. I think politically, to, to continue the argument we were making, um, there's a there's at least some chance of a kind. Of, I, I I think what I was saying yesterday. I think that what Joe Biden is trying to do, and I have lots of complaints with particular things he's done and so on. But I think in the largest measure, what he's trying to do is get us back in that posture of America as group project where we try to make 
been better. Um, you know, Obama said in one of his, someone asked him in a kind of interview at the end of his presidency, how come you didn't get more done when you had, you know, 60 Democratic senators and things? And he said, we were still operating under the kind of Reagan framework, the idea that government was the problem, that we, working together was not really something we did anymore, that uh, markets were to be encouraged at all. That, that, that framework had been so powerful. And I think Biden is, well, I mean, I think he's reincarnating not the Obama presidency, not the Clinton presidency, but the LBJ presidency, which is, you know, we say yes, it sort of makes sense since that was the first guy he got to vote for. It, you know? <laughs> uh, 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 but, but it's a. Um, it, it, it's a uh, uh, it's a powerful, interesting moment there, and in the church, and you can see the same thing happening in Catholicism in a lot of ways, and the other branch of, of I mean, Francis is one of the most hopeful and powerful and interesting figures in the, the whole world, um, and and uh, uh, the same thing, this sort of sense that that it's time to involve, you know, that, that there really is this huge project now exemplified by the fact that if we don't get to work on it, we're actually not going to have a, much of a world to live in anyway. So it, it'll be really interesting to see how uh, what we can make of all of this going forward. So they just said we have about 10 minutes left. Okay. I wish we had about eight hours left. <laughs> um, there's so much to talk about. We're going to open it up for some questions. Can I ask one at the front end? Uh, and it's a, hopefully it won't take too long. <laughs> But memoirs are about looking back, right? right? Looking back over. As you all look forward, where do you see hope? As we move forward in faith as a, as a country, what are you hopeful about? One of the things that I have become immensely more hopeful about, especially over the Trump presidency, is the people who are finally aware of what is really going on around us. And in the last few years, I've made friends either online or in real life with people that I once thought were completely hopeless. Uh, people who worked for the Bush administration, uh, people who had literally opposed things that I'd written in print and uh, about religion and about uh, about politics, and what's, I think what happened is that the Trump presidency was so shocking uh, to so many people that it was, it, was, it was like a giant consciousness raising meeting from the 1970s, you know, and it was, it, it, it really woke up a surprising number of people, and so I have these friendships now with folks that I never would have imagined I would have been friends with, and while there are still specific, you know, kind of disagreements on policy, or I wouldn't say that nice thing about George W. Bush, because I never said anything nice about George W. Bush, uh, except for Africa. Um, it, it, except for those differences, there is a lot more really thoughtful, well-placed, interesting leaders, writers, thinkers, who are all now moving a, more in similar directions. Uh, and that really, uh, that, I, I don't know if you see that too. I definitely see that. Yes, and I have great hope from watching young people around the world. Yes, um, yes. You know, I got to, I, I got to send off uh, a note last week to my uh, good friend, Greta Thunberg, uh, congratulating her on graduating from high school. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, um, you know, she, and, she and Francis, I think, are the two greatest contemporary masters of the kind of politics of gesture. Uh, so young people are there's uh, doing unbelievable work. But, but, I've heard a few too many people say to me, well, it's up to the next generation to solve these problems, which is completely, so the good news is that we've, you know, in the last 18 months or so, a, a few of us, my colleagues, B and Melanie and uh, uh, others are here, have started this third act thing for, for, you know, tell your grandparents, people over the age of 60, you know, uh, uh, and it's going great guns. We've got 
many, many, many tens of thousands of people signed up and not just signed up, working hard. There's a bunch of them going to jail today uh, uh, outside Washington, sitting in at a bank uh, uh, that lends money to the fossil fuel industry. They're working incredibly hard on climate and on democracy, the two sort of twin parts of this thing. And there's a huge third act faith group, uh, retired pastors and rabbis and things that are doing amazing work as part of that. Uh, it's really exciting to see what we're seeing is a sort of combination of people who've never done work like this in their lives and a lot of people who had done this work when they were in their first act back in the 60s and early 70s and then, you know, maybe as a generation, our second act was slightly more involved with consumerism than it was with citizenship, you know? But that's water under the bridge, and now people are like, okay, we've got one more thing we've got to do uh, uh, before we go, and we're going to do it in style, and it's really fun, so. And that's very over, which is some of the religious and denominational questions as well. Because one of the things that I that I, I'm pretty sure this is the case. Um, so the UCC, if I'm not wrong, just divested its pension fund from fossil fuels, which is incredible. But most of the other main lines came out with statements about 10 years ago divesting a sort of liquid funds in other places from fossil fuels, but left their pension <laughs> funds invested in fossil fuels. So as far as I know, right now, as we sit here today, one of the richest pension funds in religion in the world is the Episcopal Church, Church Pension Group. And if you're a retired Episcopal priest, your money is still invested in fossil fuels. And the only people who are going to be able to convince that, that fund to dis, disinvest, to get their money out of there, are you all. And, and you got to do it because the C of E divested last week, so right. uh, you know uh, the heat is on. So. so that's one of these places where this work overlaps, where um, I'm constantly telling people as well who are over 60 or just retired from mainline pastors, I know you're tired. It's been hell, <laughs> but guess what? You're just getting More started. Yeah. <laughs> well, but it, but it's much easier without all those, you know, uh, annoying parishioners around to uh, <laughs> kind of trouble, so, you know. And to threaten to fire you. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have. I do want to say... Oh, no! We talked through our questions. I do want to say... Two, we have two minutes? Okay, we have two minutes. Um, so, if somebody can ask a quick question. Thanks. Hey, everyone. I'm Andrew. Um, so, do you all know about just transition? Just the concept of as the economy transitions into clean energy, we need justice, right? Like frontline communities are protected. So, I'm curious what a just transition for the mainline church looks like, right? There's all these institutions, all this money, all this social capital that has been built up in the mainline church, and yet the people aren't there. So, what does a just transition for the institution look like in this moment? Okay, that's a, I have a two minute thing, but I, I can actually say one of the pieces of that is that I am, I am so sick and tired of the mainline talking poor. Oh my gosh, all I hear on the road, I'm so sorry, my good friends, you know I love you, but if I hear you one more time go, woe is us, there's nothing left, the roof is leaking, you know, that, that that is like, might be true in your building, but if you start thinking about what Bill and I wrote about, how the main line was this huge enterprise, which involves real estate and connections and institutional wisdom, not just tangible goods, but actually uh, goods of maturity, uh, goods of historical perspective, all kinds of goods. We, I think, continue to be one of the richest religious traditions in the world. And so 
getting our mindset off of the woe is us, we're dying, we bought the evangelical narrative about us. The main line needs therapy more than anything else. <laughs> Well, that's what I've been doing. That's very good. You're doing one heck of a job at it. You're the uh, therapist and, and cheerleader and everything else. Um, one of the things that, I mean, this, this will demonstrate how far outside the, uh, you know, religious, uh, uh, how far outside the ecclesial hierarchy I am. Um, um, one of the things that environmentalists think a lot about, of course, is efficiency. Um, and and trying to get as much done. Uh, and, and I was baptized a Presbyterian, grew up in the UCC, and then became a Methodist just because that's whatever happened to be wherever I was. You know, I do think the day is probably coming when it would make a lot of sense for us to acknowledge that nobody, almost nobody, any longer cares about the difference between Lutherans and Presbyterians and Methodists and anything else. And, uh, if the roof is leaking, it's a lot easier to fix one roof in town than four, you know. Uh, and it might be fun to kind of figure out how to gang together a little more. That's one of the things I like about this gathering here, you know, it's fun. So, who knows? Uh, one of the quick things for your information is that um, it, I don't know the name of the project. Um, I had, I had thought of this idea, and somewhere along the line, some other scholar thought about it too, is to try to figure out how much real estate the main line actually holds. And because right now we're treating it like this congregation has this and this and this and this. And what's happening is these big multinational real estate corporations, all, many of whom are responsible for the mess that Bill's trying to clean up, um, they come in and they pick off individual congregations one at a time. I, I understand that some scholars in the United States has figured out that if you add up all the main lines, that we own something like 15% of all of the real estate in the United States. That means we're the largest, if you put us all together, we're the lar one of the largest real estate holders in the country. And like, why can't we leverage the power of that ownership toward thinking about justice related to the land, the native people, African American reparations, and climate change. I, I mean, I, all the things we care about right now. Amen. And, and now I've got my uh, now I've got my Diana Butler Bass bootleg concert tape from North Carolina. <laughs> can go home a happy man. Thank you so much, man. Oh, no, and the Bob Dylan of Public Theologians. Oh, we get some music. Oh, good. Can I take a picture of y'all?